Welcome to this lecture on for the course Optimization Methods for Machine Learning and Engineering. Today will be on automatic differentiation. So automatic differentiation is something for the lazy computer scientists who don't want to manually uh, compute all the derivatives or manually get all the derivative functions that we need for optimization. So it's rather a shortcut but also a very elegant theory behind it how to add automatically get a derivative from a mathematical function or even from some numerical computer code. And we will see two applications for that. The first is space mission planning, so something like, like the NASA does. So they want to send a man to an outer planet and maybe get him back. How can we plan such a mission in order to have an efficient trajectory for our rocket? And the second example that we see is for artificial neural networks. Uh, and again, here we see that automatic differentiation is a very powerful technique. And uh, in this case, uh, is the basis for backpropagation, which is the training algorithm for neural networks. So jumping right into it, uh, what are the different ways that we have today to get to our derivative? So the, the, the gradient for gradient descent or even the Hessian, so the second derivative, if we want to use a Newton method. And of course, uh, we can write everything down on paper. So here on this top level, uh, we are in the mathematical uh, universe and uh, we can write down the, the function definition on a piece of paper and also manually then apply the rules, chain rule and product rule and so on to get to the derivative. But since we also want to numerically evaluate and numerically optimize, we can then also code this mathematical function uh, in Julia or in some other programming language and um, then here we have a, a, a symbolic representation. So either this could be compiled code or we even have a symbolic representation of the function and then we can also manipulate in the computer on the symbolic level. And there we can then apply symbolic differentiation methods to automatically uh, get from the original function definition to the derivative and this works if we stay within certain families of uh, functions for which uh, we have well transformation rules to get from the symbol symbolic representation to the derivative. And besides that on the third level we can also numerically evaluate the algorithm and by using the method of, of finite differences so just here taking the definition of the gradient and applying some h that is very, very small to get to numerically approximate the, the derivative. We don't need to do anything. We just need our uh, computer code uh, for the function and then we can evaluate at two points that are really close to one another and uh, get the derivative with numerical evaluation. But this has the disadvantage that uh, it is only an approximation and we might lose some precision here. And there's actually another way to take the computer code of our function definition and to numerically evaluate this function in a way that we get the precise gradient. And how to get the precise gradient that way, this is the magic of automatic differentiation and this is what we are learning today in this course. So now let's look at some of the alternatives and uh, have a closer look at why they are maybe, maybe not best suited. So first of all here the numerical approximation. Uh, so you might have seen uh, the picture on the left hand side in one of the first lectures. So here we have the, the definition of the derivative. Uh, so we have some small offset h and based on that we, uh, we approximate locally the, the derivative. And uh, this introduces some numerical error and this numerical error can be quantified for some uh, example function that was used by, by this paper uh, Biden in 2015. And he shows the numerical error that uh, arises and the numerical error, well, it comes from the limited precision of the IEEE 754 floating point numbers. So when you then have 32 bit or 64 bit precision floating point numbers, uh, you still get some numerical error when you uh, when you are making this age uh, smaller and smaller. 
And there are actually two reasons for this numerical error to occur. So uh, the first problem is when we choose h too big. So here when this step here is too big, then obviously the approximation locally that we make about this uh, function is, uh, is biased or there's, there's an error to it. And uh, this is what we see here on the right hand side also of this plot uh, in, in the Biden paper. And Biden actually he considers two different uh, ways to approximate the derivative locally. Uh, one is called forward method and the other is called the centering method. The difference is one is just taking the age, taking a step forward and then comparing. And the centering method, it is doing a step forward and also a step backward. And this has some numerical um, uh, advantages. It's, it's a, you can get more precision out of the, that second method. So here we have uh, the first method. Well, let's make the forward method here in blue. So this is the, the forward method here. And then the, the centering method is, uh, is this guy here. And actually, there are two reasons for this numerical error to occur. Uh, the first is if h is too big, then obviously we get a wrong approximation of um, our target function. Um, but also when we make h very small. So when we make h very small, then we have here to derive um, our result uh, by h. And h is very, very, very small. And this is introducing also numerical error because of the limited precision of our floating point numbers. And here you see that the error, uh, depending on how we choose the age, it, uh, it reaches a minimum somewhere around 10 to the minus 10 or 10 to the minus 6, depending on which of the two methods are being used. Obviously, this error depends on the target function that we're looking at. But this numerical approximation, it's an approximation and we know it's, it's, it's not correct. So the other way, and maybe the mathematically more sound way, is first to transform our function into a symbolic representation in the computer and then work on that symbolic representation. So here we have a, an expression, uh, 1 minus x plus 1 plus x squared plus 4x. And this can then be uh, represented, for example, in an expression tree internally, there's then a tree structure and uh, we then have algorithms operating on this tree structure and helping us to get to the derivative. And this has been done quite early after the invention of the first computers. Uh, in general, such systems are called computer algebra systems. And uh, well, they have internally like mechanical rules. So all you have to do is then turn the crank or internally the algorithms turn the crank. And um, um, this is like a, a, a calculus a set of mechanical rules that can be applied to get to, 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 to the result. And actually, this is not so complicated. So getting from the function or from known families of functions, and there aren't that many who are important, uh, so to get from a known set of, of functions to their derivative, or known family of functions to the derivative, um, at MIT, the students, they, for a lot of years, they did this in the first semester. So here there's a great book called Structure and Interpretation of Computer Programs. Um, this was used for many years to teach uh, first semester students at MIT uh, computer science, and they already produce such a system that can, for certain families of functions, um, find the derivative automatically. And also from uh, Peter Norvig, there's uh, a PyTools, um, solution, uh, which is more something for a lazy Sunday. Uh, so if you're interested in that in general, how, how to approach something like that, um, numerically or symbolically getting the derivative has been done by many people and it's, it's, it's really stable and, and well known. On the other hand, if we want to integrate, this is a lot harder. So um, first of all, there are some expressions that cannot be integrated with a closed form solution. For example, x to the power of x or sine of x squared, they don't have an antiderivative. So I'm not saying 
integration here I'm saying antiderivative, so it depends on whether you allow some constant offset. Um, uh, but they obviously have uh, uh, integrations possible for them, but there is no closed form solution, there are only numerical solutions. And uh, for many other families of functions, a symbolic integration is possible. And there's uh, something called the, the Risch algorithm by Mr. Risch, who developed it in the 60s. And this algorithm goes to over 100 pages and is able to uh, decide whether an, uh, whether an antiderivative exists. And if yes, it, it gives it to you back. Okay. And uh, so many of these systems were started uh, at some time in, in the 60s and many of them have survived until this day, are available as open source. For example, uh, Maxima, uh, today it is spelled with an, with an X. So Maxima, like the princess. Um, this is a system from MIT and it also it started roughly at, at this period as well. And it's still active today and you can download it and use that to get numerically, uh, symbolically, the derivative of, of functions that you are supplying to it. Okay, But today we go a third way. So today we are looking at automatic differentiation. So for the evaluation graph, we will represent the mathematical function or the expression that we have shown earlier in a different way and we will express it in a directed acyclic graph or DAG abbreviated. And in this directed acyclic graph we are reusing some of the components uh, for example um, this X which is occurring in several places uh, this uh, had uh, different nodes in the tree structure from the previous slide, but in this DAG representation we have a special node W1 that represents the X and I will plug in this W1 in all the places that are using the X directly. And uh, this, has, uh, this reuse has a couple of advantages because now I can take this graph structure here and uh, push through the gradient and, and follow the flow of the gradient in this, in this network structure. So on this slide uh, you see sometimes uh, a D for the notation of the derivative and sometimes a partial symbol for the notation of the derivative. So this might be a little bit confusing and this is oftentimes also a little bit uh, fuzzy when it is explained in, in, in mathematical uh, lectures, uh, just to make the point here. Um, the difference is that um, if I have a function, let's call it g, and it depends on x and y, and uh, now if I'm um, creating um, a partial derivative of this guy and this is maybe here g of x and y is x plus y so it's really simple huh? and if I'm creating a partial derivative of this guy so here partial by partial x um, wait that's not what I meant let's leave g up there and now we generate the partial derivative of g with respect to x then it will be just one huh? because here we see the x occurs uh, uh, like this only once in the original G. But now if I want to compute the total derivative, so the D symbol, it represents the total derivative, then it looks a little bit differently because actually we don't know whether I doesn't also depend on X. So it could be that I here is a function that also is depending on X. And uh, we just don't know that. Huh? So by just looking at the y in this notation, and this is where the mathematical notation is a bit fuzzy, just by looking at the y, I don't immediately see whether it is also depending on, on, on x or not. And so for the total derivative, here I would have 1 plus, and then again the partial derivative of y with respect to x. And uh, in, in many places you can use the partial notation and the denotation interchangeably, but sometimes 
just in the notation, if I don't immediately see from uh, of a symbol uh, on which other variables it depends, um, then we are safer, then we are on the safe side. For example, here we are then on the safe side if we are using the D notation, uh, because uh, here in the W3, when I'm looking at the W3, um, I, 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 I might know that it depends on X, but I might not um, be fully aware of that in, in, in other circumstances, and therefore then we use the, the total differentiation symbol. So all in all, here we have the, this evaluation graph where terms of the expression can be reused and I can follow the flow of, of the gradient in, in this type of network. And uh, down here, then you have the full expression for, uh, for the, for the uh, total derivative of, of f with respect to x. Okay, so this is just a, a picture uh, to, to get into your heads. Uh, this computation graph is uh, what, what we should have in the back of our minds in the following slides. Okay, now we introduce something called the dual numbers. So the term dual is, is heavily overloaded and uh, we will encounter several types of dual. Uh, so something that is dual is something in, that is equivalent and uh, so there might be different definitions of duality of uh, two different sides of the metal where I can transform be between the left and the right side of the metal uh, without any loss. So the dual is just another way of looking at a certain um, uh, topic and uh, have an alternative representation that is maybe easier to work with or that gives us additional insight. And here we have the dual numbers for automatic differentiation. You might recall complex numbers. So complex numbers, they consist of a, a real part and an imaginary part. And the imaginary part is defined in such a way that I have a special variable where i squared, special variable is i, where i squared is minus one. And this is just the way this special variable i has been defined and uh, based on this really simple definition going forward a lot of interesting structure follows and many application domains also in engineering use the dual numbers and uh, the complex numbers and um, similar to the complex numbers the dual numbers also have two parts but i'm not calling it real and imaginary i'm calling it the primal part and in addition to that I have the derivative and the special rule is that my epsilon here is defined in such a way that epsilon squared equals zero and a lot of interesting structure will follow from that. So um, we have now a new number or type of number and uh, we use this uh, sans serif um, font to represent that. So every time you encounter an X or a Y in this sans serif font, it will be a dual number for automatic differentiation and it will contain two parts, the primal part and the derivative part. And uh, we only have to recall the rule that epsilon squared equals zero. And now let's see which interesting structure follows from that. So on, on this slide, we always have on the left side one of the rules for differentiation and we have on the right side um, how this is expressed in the arithmetic of the dual numbers. But it's actually not so complicated. Let's uh, have a look at the first examples. So first of all addition and scalar multiplication. So if I'm adding two functions f and g um, and uh, taking the derivative this is the same as first deriving f and uh, also deriving g and adding them in a second step. And now when we are looking at the dual numbers here, I have a dual number x and a dual number y. I'm adding the two together. And what I get is just the primal parts added together and the derivative part of the two also added together. And this just immediately follows, follows from the arithmetic. And the same then also with uh, multiplication with some scalar value where at the end 
the, the, I can just push the scalar into the primal and derivative part of, of my dual number. Now it's getting a little bit more uh, well interesting with the product rule. So for the product rule, if I have f times g and I'm then deriving that, um, I have first f derived times g plus f times g derived. And now let's see what happens when we take two dual numbers and multiply the two together. So first of all, uh, I decompose into the primal and the dual part and then I spell out the multiplication and um, what I then get out is first I have x, y, x times y. So for the primal part, the two are just multiplied together as ordinary, ordinary real numbers would. Uh, but then for the derivative part, I get out the derivative of x times y, the derivative part of x times y, plus x times the derivative part of y. And so here we see the exact correspondence between how the, uh, the product um, behaves for the product rule in differentiation and in the dual numbers. And um, so why this equal signs here follows, maybe you can do this as an exercise. Uh, you, you, you just have to uh, ensure that the epsilon squared is, is zero and therefore you can cancel out certain parts and then you, 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 you get out with, with this type of expression here. Uh, the same with the power rule. So here for the power rule, um, uh, x to the power of r derived is r times x to the power of r minus 1 and uh, exactly the same follows also for the, the dual numbers. So in order to follow this proof here we have to see that uh, the sum on, on this side, uh, the sum we only have to follow it for the first uh, two steps I think because afterwards uh, here this epsilon in here will cancel out uh, to zero every time. Um, and uh, the proof here is done, or the, the, the little uh, term here, is done only for the natural numbers where I'm uh, counting up the integers, but actually the rule also works with um, real numbers, um, uh, but it is a little bit more involved, but um, um, actually this works quite nice also with, with any real number and not only with integers or natural numbers in, in the exponent. Okay, so what we saw is that equivalent terms or equivalent um, mechanisms emerge from the differentiation rules and also from the simple application of this arithmetic or al algebraic rules that we have for the dual numbers. And uh, now we get to one last step, which is a little bit more involved, uh, which is the evaluation of functions on dual numbers. Uh, and we need that for the chain rule. So when we are plugging function results into other functions. Um, so this is the last step and then we have the dual numbers basically ready. Now imagine that I have a function that is defined on the real numbers or with scalar input and scalar output. And uh, now I want to extend this function so that it can be used to evaluate also dual numbers. And the way this function has to be uh, extended uh, to do that is that if I, if I call f with a, uh, with a dual number, what I get as output is first f of x. So the primal part just evaluated plus f derived times x times the derivative part of x times epsilon. So the, this part, this derivative uh, of x part uh, or this dot x part that I'm using here, this is like the derivative component that was contained in the dual number x before I was even calling into f. Okay, and um, now let's see why this term here. So this term is what we want to get in the result. And uh, now let's see why this term actually makes sense. So First of all, the function f for this function f of x, we can create 
uh, a Taylor expansion. Uh, so we have, first of all, the function evaluated at a point x, and then we have the, the first derivative f at, at x, um, and we have the second derivative f, um, at x, and we saw the Taylor expansion already a couple of times prior. Um, but we can also imagine that this continues here with the third and fourth and fifth and infinitely many derivatives that we can imagine. Um, and such a full Taylor expansion actually is an exact copy or an exact representation of the original function f. So here we are not taking any shortcuts. So here we are still totally um, uh, precise in the mathematical way as long as this function is continuous. Okay, now plugging and we can have derivatives. Uh, that's, that's obviously also a result, uh, important. And now plugging our dual number x into the, uh, into the Taylor expansion, it gives us, first of all, um, um, f of x. So what you have to see here that the Taylor expansion was done around a point x. And this is taken as a given. Yeah? So, um, and now what we do is we do the Taylor expansion around the same point where the dual number has its primal part defined. So these two here now are identical. And prior here we had our Taylor function, Taylor expansion at x, but there's a different y for which I'm evaluating the Taylor expansion. And here we have now a dual number and this x occurs in two places. Uh, so in the end here we have f of x plus the derivative of x. So this just, this guy here, this guy here and this guy here, they come from up here. And uh, here now instead of y minus x uh, down here, I would have, um, let me switch colors, so this guy here. It is actually x plus x dot epsilon minus x. Uh, and then the x cancels out. And uh, what remains is this uh, x dot epsilon. And for the remaining part, uh, it works in the same fashion. However, we will always here have an epsilon squared or epsilon to the third power, epsilon to the fourth power and so on. So all the remaining parts are zero. So even though the we make the full Taylor expansion and we are mathematically still precise, we can cut out all the Taylor expansions after the first one. So what remains is exactly this uh, term down here. And this is the precise uh, result that we get for plugging the dual number into, um, into, into the function. Okay, and this then it gives us the chain rule. So down here we have the chain rule. So what happens if we have f of g of x and we are deriving that and uh, actually we get out the exact same result also by just plugging in a dual number in f of g of x. So at least here for this, for this, for this derivative part um, it evaluates to exactly the same. In order to follow here the equality, we actually we have to apply this, uh, this uh, um, differentiation rule from uh, the top part of the slide uh, two times, but it's actually not so, not so difficult to, to, to follow and to get then to the exact same result. Okay, so what we have now is a way to extend the numbers, to get from the normal real numbers to the dual numbers and to just plug them into any function and we get back um, again a dual number that has a primal part and a derivative part and the derivative part corresponds to the derivative that we would have gotten by symbolically or math in the mathematically correct fashion differentiating the function that we are evaluating first. And this sounds all well and nice, but uh, it sounds also a little bit involved and complicated. So why is this improving our situation? 
and it is improving our situation because we can just implement the dual numbers in computer code and uh, not care about um, um, a specific way that we need to define our functions differently. So we can use the computer code for our function definition as before and just call it with a dual number and get the right results back. Now let's look at this in Julia. So in Julia here um, we are first defining a structure. I think this is the first time we are defining a structure in Julia. So this is happening here. So this is like a structure, this is like a, a pojo in, in Java or like a, a struct in, in C or C++. So it's just um, well, an object with two elements that can be pulled out. And uh, here I'm, I'm defining a structure called D and I'm telling um, Julia that this is behaving like a number or that in the type hierarchy, so in Julia there's a big hierarchy of the types, that uh, this structure is somewhere below number and so many things that are defined for numbers also apply now to this, to this structure here. And in addition to the definition of D that contains the primal part and the derivative part, we also have to overload some of the uh, primitives, so some of the operators defined in, in the language. For example, the plus operator. Now for the plus operator we just say here the primal parts are being added together and the derivative parts are being added together. And uh, well, we just do that in exactly the way this uh, dual numbers were defined on, on the previous slides. And also we have a couple of well-known functions functions for which we know the derivative ahead of time. For example, the sine function, we know the derivative of this is cosine, and then we can also just overload the sine function for our D structure. Yeah. So in Julia, what is happening here is I'm saying, I'm calling the plus function, I'm calling it with, uh, with the data type D, and this is now doing a specialization of this, uh, this operator. And in the end, when Julia calls the operator, it will figure out in the type hierarchy which is the most precise definition that exists for, for this operator, and then it will use that. And there are ways to, to you will be warned when there is some ambiguity, so ambiguity cannot, cannot happen. And also Julia uh, can actually, in most cases, compile the code and you will get some very efficient binary out of it. Um, uh, but for us, what is most important is, is here not the raw speed, but the, just uh, the flexibility that we get from overloading the operators for our dual number. The same could also be done in C++, for example, where overloading of operators is also possible. Okay, now in addition to, to the raw rules for, for the arithmetic, uh, we also have to do some, some little boilerplate in Julia, so we have to uh, define automatic type conversion in places where we have a real but we need then to have a dual number and uh, we tell Julia how to automatic, automatically generate a dual number and uh, this would be this line here and uh, we also um, um, tell Julia how to pretty print the results uh, so it's all a little bit easier to interpret then. Okay, but what can we do with this now? Now, let's say I have two, two dual numbers and I'm adding them together uh, or I'm multiplying them with a scalar. Uh, this is basically just to, to show that our arithmetic rules are, are working and you should just copy and paste the, the code from this slide into a Julia shell or into a, a Jupyter notebook and uh, see that the rules are followed nicely and that we only need like, like 20 lines of code or something like that to define the, the dual numbers. Okay, and now we can also evaluate functions. So we can evaluate the sine function and also uh, the exponential function. And here we are, are using the overloading, uh, the overloaded definitions. Um, but we can also apply the dual numbers to custom functions that we are defining ourselves. For example, here we are defining a squared function that is just squaring two numbers, and then we can evaluate that with a dual number, get the right result back, and then we can also apply the chain rule by 
um, calling functions within functions and then again get the right result back. And this is magic. Yeah? So you are defining a function in a very straightforward way and we can immediately get the derivative and we don't have to care about the mathematics. And actually um, the, the algorithm for this was developed or the, the, the idea of the dual numbers to, to use that was developed in the 60s. And then for 40 years uh, people have basically ignored automatic differentiation um, because it was just um, they, they couldn't imagine something so useful could exist and then some communities um, that might have profited a great deal from dual numbers uh, haven't used them but now they can no longer be ignored and uh, many fields are, are now recognizing dual numbers and using them and are simplifying and are also replacing a lot of hard, hard um, one code with, uh, with, with something that is a lot, lot easier but equally precise just by the application of dual numbers. Okay. Um, but now it gets even cooler. So far we have only treated like mathematical functions expressed as computer code. But computer code can do a lot more than that because we have uh, control flow operators, because we can uh, do distinction by cases. We can have if and else and have, we can have switches and we can have for loops and breaks and uh, things like that. And uh, with the dual number nothing limits us to use our usual control flow operators and to apply um, dual numbers basically to any numerical algorithm. And for that we have to overload the, the control flow operators. So in Julia we can do that. For example, if we are comparing for equality, then we, are, then we say, okay, for the dual numbers we are only looking at the primal part and if the primal parts are identical, then I consider the two to be equal. And for, for is less, so here the, the larger or greater than uh, or smaller than uh, comparison, um, we are also only looking at the primal part, so we're just telling Julia this. And um, based on that, we can then define the, the absolute function for a, a dual number. So first of all here we are doing a comparison based on the definitions uh, of the previous lines. And then if it's smaller than zero in the primal part, then we return back x and otherwise minus x. Okay. And now we can use this for any algorithm. So for example, here as a very small and, and self-contained example, take the Huber loss. So the Huber loss, uh, it, it looks um, quadratic when I'm close to zero. And then when I'm going out from zero, it becomes a linear loss. So here we have two portions. We have a quadratic portion of the loss. And otherwise here we are in the linear portion of, of the loss function. Uh, so here we have a distinction by cases and uh, with the definitions on this slide it's very easy. I can just call the Huber function with a dual number and I will get out the correct derivative of the Huber function and uh, basically I didn't have to touch the definition of the dual numbers. But what is important here is um, there might be cases where my function is not differentiable everywhere. So with the Huber function I'm lucky because with the Huber function here um, at the point where I'm doing the switch between the two cases uh, the derivatives um, if I'm taking the, the if uh, case or not are actually the same um, but if I'm looking at something like a, like a step function uh, then uh, I can have a, a very big difference uh, depending on whether I'm staying in my uh, if case or going outside of it. And here my dual numbers are not seeing that. So for the dual numbers it's like if I'm taking a path through the uh, control flow path through my algorithm and only that path then is actually visible to, to the dual numbers and at the place where I'm um, where my control flow switches between cases, 
um, it might be that I don't have a very well-defined derivative, but the dual numbers will, me, will get me a derivative anyway, because uh, to them it's not visible that the case that they are at the edge where, where the case would switch over. Okay, and now some more small, um, how to say, syntactic sugar. So uh, let's add some more syntactic sugar. For example, here we have a function um, where we can just take as input a function f and um, the, the point where we want to evaluate the function f, if it's a scalar input, and uh, we get back the derivative. Uh, so here we can just say gradient of the Huber function at the point minus 5 and I get back minus 1, which is the gradient of Huber at minus 5. And I can do the same also for functions with a vector argument. Uh, it's a little bit more complicated here. So if I have a vector argument of let's say 10 elements in the vector, then I have to call the function 10 times. And every time I put an emphasis on another uh, input variable. So um, what you need to look at here is um, I'm defining here a dual number where I'm saying the, the derivative at the entry or the derivative part of the dual number at the entry is exactly one. Uh, because the derivative of x with respect to x is one and this is the point where I'm entering into the function. And then it follows through with the dual numbers and I get back the derivative part and that's correct. Uh, however, if, I'm, if I have a vector and I'm only interested in, let's say, the second element of the vector, then I would put um, the, only the dual number in the second position of my input vector when I'm calling the function. Yeah. So um, uh, I only want to have a dual number then at the second entry and for all the other uh, elements I basically uh, have a dual number of uh, x, i and 0 uh, because Julia is automatically converting the um, the, the real number that I take usually as the input um, and it's automatically converting it to a dual number that has a zero for the derivative part and only for the element to which I want to derive um, gets, uh, gets a one in, in this place and uh, so here if I have a vector of nx elements then I have to, uh, to repeat the evaluation nx times. And, but again here, it's pure magic. I'm calling the function that I want to derive uh, with a vector and I get a vector back, which is the gradient. Okay, um, what we saw so far is called the forward mode of dual numbers. Um, let's take a step back and consider a multivariate function. So a multivariate function that takes a vector as an input and returns another vector with a different dimension uh, as the output. And here, if I'm looking at the first derivative of this function here, fat f, um, the first derivative is not just a gradient um, column vector, but the first derivative is the so-called Jacobian matrix because I can derive every element of the output vector with respect to every element of the input vector. And this gives me the Jacobian matrix. So here I have in the first row all the input, all the different input elements, um, or the, the, the first output derived with respect to all the input elements. Uh, and uh, so this way the entire Jacobian matrix is built up. And uh, mathematically, when we use the dual numbers, um, we set only, when we call the function, um, the, 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 the dual number to be evaluated um, in, in the input, and therefore we retrieve one column of the Jacobian back. 
Um, so you can see this exactly here. Um, um, when we were calling the gradient function with a vector and if we then had nx different elements in, the, in our vector x, um, we would have to repeat uh, calling this function nx times and uh, in, in this case we assume that the function f returns a scalar but if that weren't the case we would every time get back uh, one column of the Jacobian. Uh, so this is just um, to, to showcase what might happen or in, 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 the, in, the, in the general case where we might have functions that return also vectors. Okay, so these dual numbers, they correspond to the forward mode. So I could also do this entire thing symbolically, but uh, doing the dual numbers for us as computer scientists, it's easier and um, uh, it corresponds to this forward mode. But if there's a forward mode, there also has to be a reverse mode, and there is. So what the reverse mode does, it first of all, the function is evaluated, and during this evaluation, we record a tape of the control flow, where we exactly see how long did we stay in each for loop, or which case in an if-else case distinction did we take, and so on. And uh, from this recorded tape of the control flow, we can compute backwards the derivative of one of the outputs um, um, with respect to any of the inputs. And by doing this backward calculation of the gradient, um, we get back one row of the Jacobian. And now depending on whether your inputs are high dimensional or whether your outputs are high dimensional, um, reverse mode might be a lot more efficient. Uh, for example, in neural networks, where our loss function for the training of the neural network, we will see this in a couple of slides, um, in the neural networks, it is a lot more efficient to use the reverse mode um, because otherwise we would have to do the evaluation of our functions millions of times when we have millions of parameters of our neural network that we want to train. And with the reverse mode, uh, we, we have some efficiency gains and we will see this also in, in, in the exercises. For the forward mode, for the dual numbers, everything is self-contained on the slides, so you don't need anything more than what we have. For the reverse mode, uh, we will just use a library because there are pre-made libraries for Julia that we can use there. Okay.